So, hello everybody. Uh, yesterday when we spoke about mitochondria, uh, we mentioned that probably the origin of mitochondria was not really related to oxygen, even though we know that these days mitochondria are one of their main functions, not by far the only function, but a very important one, is to use oxygen for metabolic purposes, for uh, allowing the electrons which come from more complicated organic compounds to be uh, uh, to find their final acceptor and to be used for making free energy. So today we'll be talking about this metabolic pathway which is called the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain, mitochondrial electron, tra electron transport chain. But before we get there, before we talk about the, all the individual members of the pathway and what goes on, Let's have a look at uh, the catabolic metabolism or catabolic pathways in our body from a more abstract uh, perspective. So let's say we start with, uh, as a metabolite, we start with glucose. But we could just as easily take a fatty acid or something, okay? Something which is normally broken down and used to make ATP. Now, if we took the whole metabolism of glucose, the whole catabolism of glucose, um, and we wrote it as a summary formula, as a, as a summary equation, as a summary process, we would say that, uh, that glucose reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, okay? This, this is the summary process of the catabolism of glucose. Again, we would get very similar summary process for fatty acids or some other glycerol or some other uh, substrate which is metabolized. Now, this summary process basically describes the burning, the oxidation, complete oxidation of glucose to carbon dioxide and, and water. And indeed, if we just took a bit of glucose, a lump of glucose or any other sugar or whatever, and we lit it up, it would start burning it would, this reaction would occur, and of course, quite a bit of energy would be released into the surroundings as heat and as light, the flame, right? This is what would happen. Now, in our metabolism, this is not actually what happens, and this, this summary process is actually divided into many different sub-processes, into many different sub-steps, um, which we will cover in today's lecture tomorrow's lecture and many other lectures to come. Now, what is the reason why in our metabolism we don't have just one big step, okay? Glucose plus oxygen, let's get energy, because of course here is the, the release of energy into the surroundings. Why is it that we have it separated, split into so many different steps? What, what do you think? Say again? In every step you gain more I, OK, the question is, why do we have it separated into se several steps? That we gain more electrons? What do you mean? So more energy or electrons. Those are two different things. Oh, you don't know. OK. Just, OK, well, we're, we're brainstorming. And that is the reason that we need to transfer Okay, but here we are also transferring electrons, aren't we? We are. We are transferring uh, the electrons. Yeah. Uh, what are we? What are we transferring them from and to? Uh, from the glucose. Yeah, from the glucose <coughs> to, the oxygen. to the oxygen. Okay, so here we are taking electrons from glucose and transferring them to oxygen. That's exactly what happens. But why does it have to be separated into so many steps in metabolism? Okay, so one reason is that we make a lot of intermediate products if we split it, and we can use them for other things. Absolutely, that's one of the reasons, okay? Here we would just break everything down to carbon dioxide, no intermediates, and we can't use them for something interesting, okay? Absolutely, that's one reason. 
there is usage of ATP or not usage of ATP in this process specifically. Or okay, there's no ATP here. Or use of, uh, <coughs> uh, of the oxygen as an, as an energy maybe. Okay, there's oxygen here, so that probably we don't really need to do that. I think for each step, like you break more bonds and then for each bond you get energy. Okay, but the, the sum of energy released has to be the same, right? Okay, the sum of energy which is released has to be the same. We can't, by going different ways, we can't get more energy, okay? So that's not it. Okay, another reason is to regulate the process, okay? If it's just in one step, there will be just one step to regulate. If we split it into 10 different steps, we, we have a much more fine controlled uh, regulation. Yeah, definitely. It would? That things happen in different compartments, that is true, but that is more like this is what happens, but it's not the reason why it happens so, okay? It's true that it happens in different compartments. Maybe because glycolysis is anaerobic and the transport chain is aerobic. Yeah, but why? That's my question, right? Why is it split into so many different processes? Efficiency. Efficiency, and what do you mean by efficiency? Okay, okay, I think that's going in the right direction. So another reason why I split into so many steps is that if all the energy was released in one step, it would be just too much energy. There would be just too much energy and the cell would not be really able to use it, okay, to make it into useful work, okay? Most of this energy in this one step is released as heat, okay? And that's not really what we want. I mean, heat is a perfectly good type of transfer of energy, but it's quite difficult to make it do work, okay? We would actually have to, in evolution, our cells would have to basically work like steam engines or something, okay? By burning something and then a steam engines. And that's not a very efficient way of using energy, okay? So another reason why it's split into several steps is that we can then much more efficiently use the bits of energy and not have it released in one go, which would obviously increase the temperature too much, etc. You want to add something? Okay, all right, so there are quite a few reasons for splitting it into several steps, and this is indeed what we have in our metabolism. And if we take the steps, we can divide them, and there were some suggestions of it already, we can divide those steps into two phases, okay? In the first phase of metabolism, we, can, we gradually break down the molecule by taking away electrons, At the same time, releasing carbon dioxide. Okay, in the end, we're gonna have six molecules of carbon dioxide, yeah? Okay, I didn't balance the equation, but you can see how it would be, okay? So in the first step, we are taking electrons away and breaking the molecule into carbon dioxide until there is no more, okay? We completely break it down to carbon dioxide. Now, Notice that in this phase, we don't use any oxygen. We don't need any oxygen. We're just taking electrons away. Okay, no oxygen is involved. Now, where do these electrons end up? Because as we said, if we oxidize something, if we take electrons from something, we have to put, it, put these electrons onto something else. And we already spoke about some places where we can put it. Yeah, one of them, is an ATH, okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna write down FAND because you'll see that it's a bit tricky, okay? So NADH, and it could be heme, and it could be some other redox coenzymes which take electrons, okay? So that's the first phase. You take electrons from glucose, fatty acid, or whatever, put it onto some, uh, some reduced coenzymes, and we make carbon dioxide. In the second phase, what happens is that we take these reduced coenzymes, such as NADH, and we reoxidize them by taking these electrons and putting them onto oxygen. Okay. 
And it is the second phase of this metabolism. So the first phase we'll cover in Krebs cycle and glycolysis and all these other ones. But it is the second phase when we take the reduced coenzymes or reduced enzymes or something and reoxidize them by using oxygen. That's what we'll cover today. Because this pathway that does this is called the electron transport chain, or more specifically, the mitochondrial electron transport chain. or the respiratory chain because it is responsible for using almost all the oxygen that we breathe in and that we use, okay? So almost all the oxygen is used in the respiratory chain, okay? Just very, very small amount of oxygen is used for other metabolic reactions. Almost all of it is used in the respiratory chain, hence the name. All right. The respiratory chain, or the electron transport chain, is located in mitochondria, and specifically, it is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So all the members of the electron transport chain are transmembrane proteins sitting in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So, let's draw this. This would be the outer mitochondrial membrane, here we have the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, from yesterday's lecture, you know that these two membranes are the same thickness, okay? They're not different. But since we're not be talking very much about the outer membrane, I just drew it as a very thin one, so that it doesn't take up half the, the blackboard, okay? But they are the same, okay? So this would be the inner mitochondrial membrane. This would be then, what? Outer. This would be? intermembrane space, and this, the matrix, okay, and this, cytosol, excellent. All right, now, the, there are several members of the respiratory chain, of the electron transport chain, uh, which take electrons from one another and they pass them on, and I will perhaps a little bit unconventionally, but there's a good reason for it, I will start describing it from the end, okay? So I will not start from the beginning, but I will start from the end. And it will hopefully become clear why I believe that is a better way of describing it. So, at the very end of the respiratory chain, we get the reaction, which is the whole point of it, okay? So in the last step of the respiratory chain, we take electrons and put them onto oxygen. So we reduce oxygen to form water, by using electrons which come from somewhere, okay? The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called complex four of the respiratory chain. It also has other names, and I will mention them in a second, okay? And this enzyme, again, it's a transmembrane protein, quite a big one. This enzyme takes electrons, lets them run through this very complicated structure of the enzyme, and in the end, puts them onto oxygen. To form water. Okay? Huh? Complex four, CPX4, complex four. How many electrons do we need to reduce a molecule of oxygen to water? We need four electrons. So what complex four does is it takes gradually one over another, takes four electrons in, and then it takes a molecule of, water, uh, a molecule of oxygen and puts the four electrons on it to make two molecules of water. That's what the en enzyme does. Now, Putting electrons onto oxygen is not an easy thing. And as we were talking about the reasons why we don't oxidize glucose or fatty acids in one go, there is an additional reason for that. Oxygen is not a very reactive gas. 
you may have heard that oxygen is one of the most electronegative elements. Okay, there's only one element which is higher electronegativity, which is fluorine. So fluorine is more electronegative, but they are quite close to each other. Okay, they are almost as almost they have almost the same electronegativity. So in theory, oxygen should be as reactive as fluorine, as in, in thermodynamic theory. Okay? It should want to take electrons from things. Okay? But in fact, that doesn't really happen. So now we are all sitting here in a 20% atmosphere of oxygen, okay? and the oxygen is not really reacting with our bodies. Right? Imagine if we were sitting in 20% fluorine. Okay? That would be rather unpleasant, okay? And the fluorine would be really reacting with our bodies and would be just dissolving our bodies. But oxygen isn't, okay? So we're sitting here and we're fine, okay? Even the wood, okay, it's not burning. It should be, thermodynamically speaking, but it doesn't. And the reason why oxygen is so poorly reactive, much less reactive than it should be, is a kinetic reason. So thermodynamically speaking, oxygen should be burning our bodies. We should all be burning now, okay? From the point of view of thermodynamics, but we are not. Because there is a kinetic barrier, and remember that thermodynamics is telling us what is possible, and kinetics, yeah, we didn't have the lecture, do we? <laughs> we will have a lecture on kinetics, uh, which is related to enzymes and everything. So kinetics is telling us how quickly will the reaction occur, and if it at all will occur, okay? And here in this case, thermodynamics is saying, yeah, we should be putting electrons on, on oxygen, it should happen, but kinetically speaking, this reaction is very improbable. Why? Well, because molecular oxygen, O2, the molecule of O2, has a very strange electronic structure. Okay? Uh, as molecules are built up, they share some electrons, some valence electrons. This is something that you've probably mostly covered at some point. Okay? And as a molecule is formed from two or more atoms, uh, the electrons basically find their places in what is called a molecular orbital. Okay, so they start sharing these electrons and there's an orbital which is shared by the two atoms, in this case two atoms, and it's called molecular orbital. And there are some rules how these molecular orbitals are populated by electrons. Based on these rules, in molecular oxygen in O2, we get, in the end, when everything is filled in, we get two unpaired electrons. Now you may recall from your previous chemistry, that if we have two electrons, they tend to pair together to form an electron pair, okay, based on opposite spins, and they just pair together and they are nicely stable as, a, as an electron pair, okay. For reasons that I will not go into, in molecular oxygen, these two electrons which are left at the top do not pair. They remain unpaired electrons, because this is the more stable configuration, okay. Now, you may have heard about molecules that have unpaired electrons. They're called, huh? They're called free radicals, okay? And usually they're extremely reactive. So if we have a molecule with an unpaired electron, it tends to be very reactive. It just tends to react with everything. But here we have two unpaired electrons, and these two unpaired electrons make oxygen very unreactive. In a simplified way, we could say that basically this molecular oxygen would have to find some other molecule that has two unpaired electrons in order to react with it, in order to make bonds. And that's very unlikely because normal compounds, like organic compounds or whatever, don't have that many unpaired electrons. Okay? So that's why, again, in a very simplified way, that's why oxygen doesn't really want to react with normal stuff. And that is the reason why we can't really oxidize glucose so easily in our body because oxygen doesn't really want those electrons, kinetically speaking. Thermodynamically speaking, it really wants them, okay? But kinetically, eh, it's difficult to do it, okay? Now, in the case of burning sugar, as we said in the beginning, okay, we could just take sugar and burn it, we see that this reaction proceeds. But this reaction, burning, combustion, only proceeds after we change the electronic configuration of oxygen. So f what we do when we light something uh, on fire is that we heat the oxygen, and as it heats up, as it gets energy, those two unpaired electrons jump to a higher orbital, and they pair. 
and then oxygen becomes extremely reactive and starts burning stuff. Okay? This new form, this excited form of oxygen is called singlet oxygen. It's usually denoted as this thing, 1O2, okay, singlet oxygen. There are two forms of singlet oxygen. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, so what I describe is just one type of singlet oxygen. But this excited oxygen with paired electrons or with electrons at a higher orbital is the one which is extremely reactive. Okay? So we need to heat things up in order for oxygen to become reactive. Now, that is not really an option in our cells. We can't heat this oxygen to whatever 300 degrees for it to start reacting and accepting electrons. We have a different trick for it. We use cofactors in this enzyme, in this enzyme complex, in complex four, which can trick oxygen into reacting, into accepting electrons. And these specific cofactors here, which do it, are ions of transition metals, and more specifically of copper and iron. So what we have in the active site, I mean active site, there are lots of active sites in this, it's a very complicated protein, very complicated enzyme, but where this reaction happens, where electrons really get onto oxygen, is a place called a binuclear center. Binuclear, it has two nuclei, two centers, okay? One of them is a cuprous ion, or copper ion, because it, can be, it will cycle between cuprous and cupric. And the other one is a ferrous iron, which can turn to ferric iron, okay? And they are sitting in the enzyme next to each other. The copper is bound to amino acids, and the iron is bound to heme molecule, okay? So what I drew here is like, imagine that we're looking sideways onto heme molecule, which is a big flat thing, okay? So this one is in heme, and this one is just chelated, it's just attached to amino acids. The oxygen comes, I'm gonna use a different color. The oxygen comes between these two metal ions, okay? And then the enzyme starts sending electrons to these two ions and they start giving those electrons step by step to the oxygen. Now, how do these transition metals, how do they trick oxygen to taking electrons from them if we said that it really, it's kinetically very difficult? Well, some ions of some transition metals, like copper and iron, have electronic configurations which look like free radicals. They're not really free radicals, but they look like free radicals. And this is what tricks oxygen into accepting electrons, into reacting with them and taking electrons from them. Okay? That's also the reason why oxygen reacts with iron quite easily, right? Iron rusts. Okay? That's because it looks to oxygen like it's a free radical, so it will react with it, but we won't react with it, or not easily. Does it make sense? So, the trick that complex four uses is taking these two ions and basically putting gradually, step by step, four electrons onto the molecule, making two molecules of water. That's what happens in complex four. Now, where does complex four get those electrons? Well, the electrons come from a mobile carrier of electrons called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a small protein molecule which contains a molecule of heme. So another, another heme, but this time in cytochrome C. And since heme contains ferrous iron, it can accept elect an electron, turning from ferric to ferrous, and then it can give the electron back, okay? So that's how it carries an electron. It reduces itself, yeah, to ferrous, and then it gives off the electron somewhere else and oxidizes to ferric, 
that shouldn't be mysterious. So that's exactly what happens here. So a reduced cytochrome C, which is called ferrocytochrome C, ferrocytochrome C, gives an electron to complex four. And when four electrons are stored in complex four, they will be transferred to oxygen to make water. Yeah? This is the reason why complex four, another name for complex four, is cytochrome C oxidase. Because it oxidizes cytochrome C, right? Cytochrome C, ferrocytochrome C. So ferrocytochrome C is the reduced form of cytochrome C. And then we have ferricytochrome C, which is the oxidized form of cytochrome C. Ferro, ferric, from ferrous and ferric. Yeah? So complex four, another name for complex four is cytochrome C oxidase because it oxidizes cytochrome C. Now, for all these complexes, actually for all enzymes, in addition to the names that we normally use, like complex four and cytochrome C oxidase and whatever, we also, do you have a question? No. No? Okay. Uh, we also have systematic names. So we can name these enzymes systematically, okay? Now, which class of enzymes do you think this would be in? It's, it's an oxidoreductase, absolutely. So the name of the enzyme is going to be oxidoreductase, I mean the systematic name, okay? We call it complex four or cytochrome C oxidase, but systematically it's an oxidoreductase. And the rules for naming oxidoreductases is such that you take the substrate from which we take electrons, so the one which is being oxidized, you put a colon between them, and you take the substrate, then you name the substrate to which the electrons are transferred, and then you put oxidoreductase next to it. So in the case of complex four, or cytochrome oxidase, the systematic name would be ferrocytochrome C, colon, oxygen, oxidoreductase. Takes electrons from this, puts them onto here, oxidoreductase. We take these, the substrate from which electrons are taken, colon, then the substrate to which the electrons are transferred, because oxidoreductase is they take electrons and put them somewhere else. That's what they do, right? So first the enzyme, first the substrate from which the electrons are taken, then the substrate to which the electrons are taken, in this case, oxygen, or dioxygen, if we want it to be really precise, dioxygen, because it's not an atom of oxygen, it's a molecule, but that doesn't matter very much. Oxidoreductase. Yeah? Excellent. Good. So basically, the cytochrome C molecule has to go four times to complex four in order to accumulate the four electrons to reduce the whole oxygen. Or we need four molecules of cytochrome C. Yeah? Or two, which come twice. You know what I mean, right? Good. Now, where does cytochrome C get the electrons from? Well, it gets it from another big complex of the respiratory chain called complex three. Complex three. So what does complex three do? Well, it takes two electrons from some other donor of electrons called coenzyme Q, and I will get to that, or ubiquinone, it's the same thing. Ubiquinone or coenzyme Q, we'll get to that. Takes those two electrons from it, and through a complicated path, actually two complicated paths, but that's not, you don't need to know that. Through some paths, it passes these two electrons one by one to cytochrome C. So cytochrome C can only carry one electron, okay? Because it only has one ion of iron, which can only accept one electron. So this thing can carry only one electron and can give only one electron to complex four. But complex three basically takes two electrons from coenzyme Q and splits them and then gives them one by one to cytochrome C. Okay? It takes two electrons from CoQ, 
splits them, and then gives them off one by one. Right. What would be the systematic name for complex three? Okay. Ubiquinol. Ferro cyto sorry, ferre cytochrome C, because the receiving form is the ferre, is the oxidized form. Okay? Ferre cytochrome C oxidoreductase. Yeah? That's the systematic name. But we usually call it complex three, or we use we call it cytochrome BC1. There are many different names for it, but the systematic one is this. But it So you would have to take for one molecule of oxygen to be reduced, this has to happen twice, and this has to happen four times, yes. Okay? Good. What is this CoQ and why did, well, first of all, uh, notice that I drew cytochrome C here in the intermembrane space, because that's where it is, okay? Cytochrome C is a protein which is in the intermembrane space, but it's not just floating around in the intermembrane space, it is attached to the outer surface of the inner membrane. Yeah? This whole thing is the inner membrane and is attached to the outer surface of it. And it is attached by means of electrostatic interaction. So basically the protein has a domain which is positively charged and the phospholipids in the membrane are negatively charged. So those two things attract each other. Okay? There are negative charges here in the phospholipids and they attract each other, and that's why cytochrome C is attached electrostatically to the outer layer of the inner mitochondrial membrane. It can be released from it. It happens in apoptosis, etc. So there are situations when cytochrome C can be released and get into the cytoplasm and everything, but normally it sits on the outer membrane and kind of moves around between those complexes in order to carry electrons from where, where they are needed. Okay? Coenzyme Q, on the other hand, notice that I drew it as if it was inside the membrane because that's exactly where it is. You can imagine that, that coenzyme Q, which is not a protein, so coenzyme Q is not a protein, it's a small molecule, and it's literally dissolved between the fatty acid chains of the phospholipids. Okay, So it moves between the fatty acid chains of phospholipids and it's just dissolved between them. Now, coenzyme Q or ubiquinone, the structure of it looks like this. That's not something you need to know, okay? You need to learn or anything. But it looks something like this. This is the quinone head of ubiquinone. You can see, those of you who've done enough organic chemistry can see that it's a quinone, okay? This is where the accepting and releasing electrons happens. So this quinone can be reduced by two electrons to, to quinole. So we add two electrons and we make it into a quinole. and then we can move it back. So this is, this is how ubiquinone carries electrons, okay? Takes electrons, turns into a quinol, and then gives them off to complex three and gets turned back to quinone, okay? So for cytochrome C, it was just changing iron two plus to iron three plus. Here we are reducing quinone to quinol and back, okay? That's how it carries electrons. Now, so this is, this is where the redox magic happens, okay? But this tail thing, which is an isoprenoid tail, and we'll talk about isoprenoids when we talk about the synthesis of cholesterol, etc. Okay, so this is something that will come up. But this isoprenoid chain in our coenzyme Q in our mitochondria is much, much longer than this. In fact, you may have heard about coenzyme Q written as CoQ10. Okay, and creams and everything, okay, CoQ10. The 10 here says that this chain has 10 five carbon units. So if I drew the whole tail of our CoQ10, 
some other organisms have shorter CoQs, okay? Yeast, for example, has CoQ2, so that would be just two five carbon units. But we have 10 of them, so if I wanted to draw the whole thing, I would probably have to go to the next room, okay? Just to draw how, how long the molecule is. And it's this very long tail which anchors CoQ in the membrane because it's extremely hydrophobic. It has such a long alkyl chain, basically, that it's impossible to dissolve it in water and it will nicely stay inside the membrane. Okay? It doesn't want to leave the membrane, which is quite important because if, the, if it left the membrane, it would start leaking electrons and that's not what we want. Okay? So it's an evolutionary trick how to keep it nicely hidden in the membrane by making it extremely hydrophobic because of this long tail. All right, so here is coenzyme Q, and the next obvious question is, where does coenzyme Q get the electrons from? There are many sources of electrons for CoQ, many. And this is the reason why we started from the end, because if we started from the beginning, we would first have to list all the enzymes that start the respiratory chain, and it would be a bit strange, okay? So that's why we started from the back, because this is constant, this is always there. But then CoQ can get electrons from many different enzymes, okay? One of the enzymes that gives electrons to CoQ is called complex one. Okay, complex one is a massive protein, it's huge. It contains 45 different subunits. It's really, really, really big. And complex one is an enzyme which takes electrons from NADH. Reoxidizes it to NAD+. And those two electrons, through complicated pathways, very complicated pathways, get transferred to CoQ. What would be the systematic name for complex one? Oxidoreductase, more precisely NADH, ubiquinone, because that's the oxidized form, ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Yeah? That's complex one. So that's where all the NADH from all the metabolic pathways in the, uh, in the matrix will be reoxidized. Two electrons, two electrons. It's NADH, okay? Forget about this plus H plus. It, it's not really important for anything. It's true, it's there, it's just confusing. NADH to NAD plus, that's it, okay? It just becomes really confusing. Two electrons go to CoQ. So complex one is one possible source for coenzyme Q, of electrons for coenzyme Q, and then the rest of the respiratory chain, right? Another possible source of electrons for CoQ is an enzyme called succinate dehydrogenase. It is an enzyme of the Krebs cycle. We will talk about it tomorrow. Well, not I, but someone else will. It's called succinate dehydrogenase, and it turns succinate to fumarate. It takes two electrons from succinate, two electrons from succinate, and it puts them onto coenzyme Q. Okay? No. Succinate to fumarate, two electrons get put onto Q. It is also in the membrane. That's why I drew it in the membrane. Okay? It's also in the membrane. It's a transmembrane protein. It's called succinate dehydrogenase. And it is also, but unfortunately often confusingly, called complex two. Okay, for historical reasons, it's called complex two, but 
the real name of it is succinate dehydrogenase, or the systematic name would be Succinate, succinate ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Yeah. So this is complex too, but it's better probably to call it succinate dehydrogenase because that's what it is. Now somebody started suggesting something about FAD. Yes, this enzyme contains FAD inside, but who cares? Okay. Complex one contains about 15 different cofactors inside. Am I telling you about them? No. Why should I be telling you that this contains FAD inside? It also contains some FES clusters and stuff, okay? Who cares? It's not important, okay? There are loads of different cofactors in these ones. We don't really talk about them. The important thing is that complex two, or succinate dehydrogenase, takes electrons from succinate and puts them onto coenzyme Q. That's it. That's what it does. Okay? So all the pictures that do something about FAD and whatever, they are wrong, okay? It's not true. The only thing that complex 2, two does is it oxidizes succinate to fumarate and puts those electrons onto CoQ. It doesn't do anything else. Good. That's not the end of it, because I said that there are many enzymes that give electrons to Q. So, another enzyme which can give electrons to Q is called ETF dehydrogenase. This ETF stands for electron transferring flavor protein. Do you want me to write it down? Yeah. It's a very long name. Electron transferring, transferring flavor protein. And what this enzyme does, it takes reduced ETF, which is the electron transferring flavor protein, and oxidizes it to oxidized ETF and two, it takes two electrons from it and puts it onto Q. Reduced ETF to oxidized ETF. Okay, we don't have any easily, I mean, I could probably call it red and ox or something just to make it clear, okay? So reduced ETF to oxidized ETF, takes two electrons, puts them onto Q. So is an alternative name for complex No, it's a completely different protein. Like we had complex one, then we had complex two, now it's ETF dehydrogenase. Okay? There are completely unrelated proteins. But it passes complex two? No. Where is complex two? No complex. <laughs> so it's just a protein that passes. So let me just say it again because there's some confusion. Okay? All the way from complex four to CoQ, it's always the same. The path is always the same. But there are many different enzymes which can give electrons to coenzyme Q. One of them is called complex one. Takes electrons from NADH, passes them to CoQ. Another one is complex two. Takes electrons from succinate and puts them onto Q. A third one is ETF dehydrogenase. Takes electrons from reduced ETF and puts them onto Q. Why everybody gave this to the Q? Where else would they give this? Hmm. Okay. The whole point of the respiratory chain is to take electrons from somewhere and put them onto oxygen. That's the goal. That's what we need to do. Okay? And we do it by passing electrons com through complex four, cytochrome C, complex three, CoQ. Now, the, co the electrons coming to CoQ can be coming from many different enzymes. Okay, so this is the, the first common path. Here everything converges and then runs through the rest of it. Okay, it's not that it's more important. I mean, they're all important, okay? They're all important. Now, what is this ETF? Why am I telling you about this enzyme? Well, this ETF is a carrier of electrons from beta oxidation. 
in beta oxidation of fatty acids, which we'll cover as a separate pathway, the electrons from fatty acids are carried both in NADH, that's one carrier of electrons from beta oxidation, and the other carrier of electrons from beta oxidation is ETF. You will see in beta oxidation that this ETF is often called FAD, but it's not FAD, it's ETF. It's a protein which contains, yeah, it contains FAD inside, but whatever, okay? It's called ETF. Does it make sense? It will become a little bit clearer once we talk, I mean, when, when you discuss beta oxidation. Yeah, I can, I'm not gonna give you the whole beta oxidation, okay? But in beta oxidation, fatty acids are oxidized and chopped up into pieces into acetyl-CoA, okay? In the process, electrons are taken from them and put onto carriers of electrons. One of these carriers is NADH, and we know already about NADH. It will be reoxidized by, by complex one, okay? Another carrier of electrons from beta oxidation is called electron transferring flavoprotein. It's a flavoprotein because inside it contains FAD, but it's called ETF, and this ETF will be reoxidized by ETF dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that we just covered. Yeah? Good. There are many more enzymes that give electrons to Q. One of them, for example, we will talk about it when we talk about synthesis, the synthesis of nucleotides, is called dihydroorotate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme in the synthesis of pyrimidines, which also takes electrons from something and puts them onto Q. So there will be another enzyme here. You will hear about another enzyme called glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, which is part of a shuttle of reducing equivalents, okay? We'll talk about it, or you'll talk about it uh, in glycolysis and what happens there. That's another enzyme that takes electrons from glyceraldehyde phosphate and puts them onto Q. So you could say that, okay? So imagine that in the inner membrane, there are many different enzymes which can all give electrons to coenzyme Q, okay? Complex one is just one of them. Complex two is another one. ETF dehydrogenase is a third one. Glycerol dihydrogenase dehydrogenase is another one. Dihydroorotate dehydrogenase is another one. There are just a lot of them. And they all give electrons to Q and then they run all the way to oxygen. Does this make sense? Good. That's the respiratory chain. So let's take a short break, three minutes, and we'll continue to why we're actually doing this. So the next thing that I want to discuss is why it is, what is the principle behind, what is the reason why electrons flow in this sequence, in this direction? And the reason why that happens is that the individual members of the sequence have different affinity, different willingness to accept electrons. So we start with compounds or members of the chain which have a relatively low affinity to electrons, which don't really want to accept electrons very much, and we gradually move to those members that have a much higher affinity to electrons, and of course, we end with oxygen that has, except fluorine, the highest affinity to electrons. So what we use is a difference in this affinity to electrons to make those electrons to flow in this direction. So now they're not gonna flow in the opposite direction, they will always, always flow towards oxygen. Now this measure of affinity to, to electrons is called a reduction potential. Okay, makes sense, a potential for reduction. Reduction is accepting electrons, yeah? It's a reduction potential. Uh, no, the affinity itself, the measure of the affinity to electrons is called a reduction potential, okay? Potential for reduction, for accepting electrons, okay? And we start with things that have relatively low reduction potentials, and we move towards high reduction potentials. Again, it's a potential for reduction, so the ability to accept electrons, and it goes up and up and up 
and with oxygen, it's the highest that we can get. Okay? The reduction potential of oxygen turning to water is about plus 1.2 volts. It's measured in volts. It's a potential, right? You don't need to know those numbers, okay? It's just for illustration. So oxygen has a very high reduction potential. 1.2 volts is one of the highest that we can get of any element, okay? Fluorine would be higher, but, you know. Now, if we take, for example, complex one as the starting place, and we take the electrons from NADH, the reduction potential of NADH is about minus 0.3 volts, okay? Minus 0.3 volts. So you can see that it's much lower reduction potential. It doesn't really want those electrons very much, okay? It still wants them much more than glucose, for example, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to pull them away from glucose and put them onto NADH. But in the context of the respiratory chain, the affinity of NADH to electrons is not great. It's minus 0.3. And that's why, by slowly increasing the potential, we move these electrons along the chain. Now, I didn't tell you really anything about the inside structure of those complexes, but there are many different subunits, okay? There are many different coenzymes like FES clusters and HEMES and, and FAD and FMN and all sorts of things. And the electrons are jumping through all these little parts with ever increasing reduction potential. Okay, so when we talked about splitting the metabolism into so many different steps, here, even, without, even within this respiratory chain, there are many tens of steps that actually take place, and each of them increases the redu reducing potential. Okay, so that's why electrons flow in this direction. Now, this difference in reduction potentials between the beginning and the end is what also allows us to do some work. So the same way if we have a dam, okay, and there's a lot of water up high, and then we allow it to flow down, we can have a turbine start turning or something, okay? So we can do some work because of the potential difference. And that's exactly what we do here as well. So there's a potential difference in this case of in reducing potentials, in reduction potentials, okay? And we use this difference to do some work. What is the work that we do here? we transport protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Okay, so once again, the flow of electrons, it, the electrons really want to flow towards oxygen, but we put a lot of, you know, obstacles to them. And since the electrons really want to go, they have to jump over the obstacles. And this jumping over the obstacles allow us, allows us to push, to transport protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Okay, does it make sense? It's the? Well, yeah, I mean, as, as we are, you mean the gradient, the concentration gradient? Yeah, I mean, as we are pumping protons into the intermembrane space, of course, the concentration of protons in the intermembrane space will become higher than it is in the matrix, so we'll create a gradient, and then we are pushing it against this grad gradient. Yeah? Now, only three members of the respiratory chain are capable of transporting protons. So we mentioned a lot of them, okay, but only three of them are capable of transporting protons. The rest of them are not using the energy for anything. Okay? It is complex four, complex three, and complex one. Okay, so this, in this case, is complex one. So these three complexes, when, as they are allowing the electrons to flow through them, they also pump protons into the intermembrane space. And that's the work that they are doing. Why? It will become clear in a second, okay? So this potential difference we turn into a concentration gradient of protons between the intermembrane space and the matrix. Now this concentration gradient is not just a concentration gradient, it is also a electrical potential difference because we are pumping positively charged ions 
That means that the intermembrane space will become positively charged and the matrix will become negatively charged, relatively, relative speaking. So we get a potential difference, electrical potential difference between them. And in a working mitochondrion, the potential difference across the inner mitochondrial membrane is about minus 150 millivolts. We usually denote it as delta psi, okay, the Greek letter psi. And it is approximately minus 150 millivolts. Okay, now that is a lot. That's a huge potential difference, okay? On a plasma membrane, for example, in a cardiomyocyte, in a cardiac muscle, we would get a potential difference of maybe minus 70 or something like that, okay? Here we have minus 150. It's a massive, massive voltage difference between the intermembrane space and the matrix. Now, bearing in mind that the thickness of the membrane is about yeah, six, seven, eight, something like that, nanometers. So we have minus 150 millivolts over six nanometers. So if we took it into our world, that's several tens of millions of volts over one meter. So imagine that we would have two sides of the membrane, which is one meter apart, and there would be a voltage of, let's say, 20, 30,000 volts, okay? It's a massive electrical field, okay? which is doing a lot of things, and actually the membrane has to be really well built to withstand this massive force, okay? And it is this potential difference, this force, this electrical force, that we use to make ATP. So that's the reason why we have that. Okay, so we're pumping protons to make this massive force, and then we have another enzyme called ATP synthase, which basically allows the protons to go back into the matrix. So these protons that have accumulated thanks to the respiratory chain, okay, it allows the protons to go back, which they obviously want because there's this massive potential, okay, so they really want to go back into the matrix. But once again, it puts a lot of obstacles for the protons to go through. It doesn't just make a hole, okay? What it does is this transmembrane domain of the enzyme is composed of 10 different subunits. And what happens there is that one of those subunits takes one proton from the intermembrane space and passes it to the other subunit. And this passes it to the next subunit. And this passes it to the next subunit. And as it happens, for each passing of the proton to the next subunit, the whole ring rotates like this. And as we are allowing a lot of protons to flow in, the whole enzyme starts rotating like a turbine, literally like a turbine. Now this rotation, and I will have to draw it in a smaller scale because otherwise the whole enzyme would be, yeah, all the way down to the cellar. I mean, there, there are no cellars here, but anyway. Uh, so I'm gonna redraw it at a, at a different uh, scale. So here is the ring, which is inside the membrane, which is rotating. And the rotation is transferred to another domain called the central stalk, which is a big part of protein, which is kind of bent like this. And so you can imagine that this is moving around. Okay, this is rotating. And around the central stalk, we have three big subunits, actually six subunits, but let's pretend they are just three. Okay, so they're covering the central stalk. And since the central stalk is bent like this, as it rotates, it pushes at the three subunits which are around it. And, it's, and when, it, when it pushes onto the subunit, it basically allows ADP and phosphate to be welded together to make ATP, okay? I'm describing it in a bit of a, you know, kindergarten terms. Of course, we could talk about thermodynamics and, and equilibria and non-equilibria, whatever, okay? But I think it, it is a good metaphor to think about, because this, what I'm describing, is actually what happens. There's an actual rotation and that it's an actual pushing, okay? And the pushing allows, it, it creates conditions for ADP and phosphate to be joined together into a ATP, 
Okay? So this is what actually happens. The enzyme is called ATP synthase. There was a Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery of the mechanism uh, to John Walker. Uh, and you can easily find on YouTube uh, animations or even microscopic, actual microscopic videos of the rotation mechanism. Okay? The enzyme itself is too small to be seen in, in a microscope, but what they did was they basically attached a very long fluorescent filament to it, and then they, then they took pictures of the rotation. So it really does happen, okay? It really does rotate, okay? The structure of the enzyme is a little bit more complicated. There's some peripheral stalk and whatever, but that's not the important. This is the principle behind it, yeah. No, the flow of protons from the intermembrane space into the matrix pushes onto the protein so that the protein starts rotating, okay? I mean, the proton, is it rotating? Well, not really. It's taken to this subunit and then to this subunit and to this subunit. It kind of moves along the, across the membrane and that pushes the, the, uh, the enzyme to start rotating, okay? Of course, the only thing that's rotating is this ring and this, this central stalk this thing is stable and that's why it pushes onto it as it rotates. Again, look at the animations, it's very clear. Once you, once you see it, you will remember it quite easily. So this is the whole point, okay, well, at least half the point, okay, of the respiratory chain and then the, the synthesis of ATP, okay? So half the point of the respiratory chain is to get rid of those electrons, we need to get rid of them. But as we are get, getting rid of them, we also pump protons into the intermembrane space. That's how we use the energy. And then we use the potential to make ATP. Okay, so the ATP synthase then makes ATP from ADP and phosphate. And this ATP then of course be used for other processes. Now, since you can see that the synthesis of ATP occurs in which compartment? In the matrix. It occurs in the matrix. So if we want to use the ATP outside of the mitochondrion, outside of the matrix, we first have to transport it out of the, mat uh, out of the mitochondrion across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And there's a special transporter called ANT, adenine nucleotide translocator. It's not that important. It's a transporter for ATP, which exchanges ATP and ADP and phosphate, okay? Moves it around so that we can use it elsewhere. And I will just give you a little preview because we'll talk about this later on. This ATP, which is exported from the matrix into the intermembrane space, does not really diffuse into the rest of the body. Remember, we said that diffusion is not really something that happens very much, okay? Everything is too thick and it would just take too long. So in fact, what happens is that just outside of the inner mitochondrial membrane, in the intermembrane space, there is an enzyme called creatine kinase, which takes the phosphate from ATP and puts it onto creatine, making phosphocreatine, or creatine phosphate. And that's a much smaller molecule which can then travel out of the mitochondrion and can move around at least to some extent because ATP is too big. And the ADP which was formed by this returns immediately back to the ATP synthase and can be reoxidized. So the ATP which is formed here is exported through ANT and then comes back as ADP and is being constantly reoxidized. And here we are turning to creatine phosphate. And we'll talk about that once we talk about uh, uh, muscles and, and, and etc. Okay, so this is just a, a little bit of a preview. Yeah. So does creatine phosphate take, take just the phosphate? Just the phosphate. Okay, and then it's much smaller, can move around a little bit, but it keeps the free energy. It, it is still a, a macroergic compound, so it keeps the energy, it doesn't lose any energy, but it's much easier to move around and, and, and then when it's needed, it gets converted back to ATP but that, that may happen somewhere completely different. Good. Well, it sort of does. It does, it does create ATP for the whole body, but the ATP which is formed here does not get very far. It's actually the energy 
in ATP is transferred as creatine phosphate, is transported into the, into the rest of the cell as creatine phosphate. Okay? So the energy is, crea is not created, but you know, is transferred or stored here, but it doesn't really travel around the cell as ATP, or at least most of it doesn't. Okay? Good, yeah. To creatine phosphate? Yeah, yeah. So by transferring the phosphate to creatine phosphate, we keep the energy in the creatine phosphate. And from creatine phosphate, it can easily be transferred back to ADP to form ATP without any loss of energy. Okay? But again, this was just a preview. Okay? We'll talk about it more when, when in the lecture about muscles. Okay? So this is just a, a connection between the two. All right. Now, what would happen, what would happen, imagine that this is all running, okay, and we would have some method to make a hole into the inner mitochondrial membrane, one or two or three or a hundred holes into the membrane. What would happen? So protons would, would be free to back into the matrix, right? There would be nothing stopping them. There wouldn't be any potential to make ATP, so the ATP production would stop. That's absolutely correct. What else would happen? The holes are in all the outer membrane? Inner membrane. Inner membrane. Okay? In the outer membrane, there are holes all the time. Okay? The outer membrane is holy. The organization in the air particles in the mitochondria are also would be a mess. It's very condensed inside. Yeah, 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 you're right, but we just made holes, so protons flow freely into the matrix. Okay, so ATP synthesis will stop. Huh? They will not react with the electrons, no, absolutely not. The NADH would be reduced as well. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. These are protons, and reduction happen with the, happens with electrons, yeah, different things. The NAD would, wouldn't be reduced. It wouldn't be re reduced? But why? Because the complex won't have any work. No, actually complex one would be running much faster because it wouldn't have to push any protons against the gradient. So no, no re redox things, okay? Just protons will, yes, the energy, correct, thank you. The energy which was stored in the gradient in this massive potential would turn to heat because normally we use it to make work, we would use it to make ATP, right? But since we just made holes and the, the, the protons can just easily flow back, the energy can't disappear, okay? It's, it's the law of conservation of energy. It can't disappear. It will just turn to heat because we're not doing any work, any ordered transfer of energy. We will get disordered transfer of energy, which is heat. So what happens is if we made holes into the inner membrane of a functioning mitochondrion, it would heat up massively. It would start producing a lot of heat. And this is something that evolution actually started using. So in our cells, but especially in cells of organisms which hibernate or which need to make heat to survive, contain a protein called uncoupling protein or UCP1. Uncoupling protein, UCP1, which is basically just a channel in the inner mitochondrial membrane, which allows protons to flow back into the matrix without making ATP. This produces heat and is used by many organisms, bears and mice and whatever, to make heat so that they survive winter, okay? Because many, some organisms which in winter they can move around, they will probably survive. But if they hibernate, if they sleep, okay, the whole winter, they would freeze. They have to start producing heat. They, they're not going to be producing it by moving around. And this is the mechanism. So these organisms, these animals, contain a specialized tissue called the brown adipose tissue. And the brown adipose tissue is not there to store fat. I mean, it does store fat. But the whole point of brown adipose tissue is to use the stored fat to run beta oxidation and the respiratory chain to make a lot of proton gradients, okay? And then by UCP1 just allowing them to go back in. 
and that's what produces heat, and that's what basically saves the, uh, the animals from freezing to death. Now, humans also have brown adipose tissue, especially newborn babies. They do have brown adipose tissue, and it is responsible at least partly for the production of heat, which makes sense, right? So newborn babies, they can't really move very much to produce heat, so they will produce some heat through the brown adipose tissue. As humans age, as they grow and age, the amount of brown adipose tissue decreases. Relatively recently, and I think it, we can it was quite controversial, but I think we can now say that even adults have little bits of brown adipose tissue. It's, it's mostly here somewhere uh, at the back, okay? Little bits of brown adipose tissue, but it's probably not very important for keeping us warm or for using calories or anything like that. What has been observed, and that's a kind of specialized add-on, what has been observed is that in some animals, mice, and potentially in humans, a normal white adipose tissue can be converted to what is called beige adipose tissue. So it's somewhere halfway between brown and white, okay? It's not quite brown, it's not quite white, and it can probably produce some heat as well, okay? But that's, that's something if you're super interested in like obesity and whatever, then you can study beige adipose tissue and what they do. Uh, but humans don't really have, adult humans don't really have a lot of brown adipose tissue and doesn't seem to be so important for our physiology but many other animals do. So this is the uncoupling protein, UCP1. There are also other uncoupling proteins whose function is not really well understood, okay? They don't seem to be responsible for producing heat. They are also in other tissues, not just in adipose tissue. We don't quite know, don't, we don't exactly know what, what, what they're doing. Now, this was a protein, this is a protein. This is a UCP which forms a channel in the mitochondria, in the, in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and does these things. However, it was discovered, accidentally, that we can also have chemicals, small molecules, which basically do the same thing. So these are called uncouplers, chemical uncouplers. They don't really make holes into the membrane, but what they can do is basically move across the membrane and ferry the protons with them. So they will bind a proton here, bring it to the matrix, release it, go back, bind a proton, release it, and they just move quickly across the membrane, and it, the effect is the same as if they made a hole, right? The effect is the same, they allow protons to go in. And these chemical uncouplers were discovered by complete accident in the beginning of the 20th century, where especially women, so people working in ammunition factories making grenades and explosives, etc., many of them started losing weight Okay, they're starting massively losing weight and many of them died uh, because of that, okay? And for a long time, nobody knew what, what, um, what the cause was and then it was discovered that the cause was a component of those explosives called dinitrophenol. Dinitrophenol was a, a component of those explosives and as the women, as the people, it was mostly women because of obviously men were fighting or dead, oh, okay? So uh, it was mostly women, but yeah. Um, they came into contact with quite a lot of these dinitrophenol, and as we now know, dinitrophenol is an uncoupler. It can move between the, the two compartments quite easily across the membrane and ferry, you know, carry, carry uh, protons to the matrix. And they were losing weight because the nutrients were being burned by all these metabolic pathways, but the potential was not really used for making ATP, it was just dissipated by this, um, uh, by this uncoupler, okay? Now, of course, this was discovered much, 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 much later, because we only understand these mechanisms that I just described of the respiratory chain since about 1980s, okay? So it was quite late, late 1970s, early 1980s. It was quite late in the 20th century when all these mechanisms were actually discovered, okay? So for a long time, nobody knew how dinitrophenol worked, but now we know that it is an uncoupler, yeah. But then it stops the ATP creation, so how Absolutely, yeah, and that's why so many of them died. So the whole metabolism is working, is actually working much faster. They are burning through a lot of nutrients, 
but the energy from those nutrients is converted to heat, not to ATP. So that's why they're losing weight, because all their fat and, and everything that they eat gets immediately burned, but all the energy is released as heat. That's why they're losing weight. But this, what you said, is absolutely crucial. Because not only were they losing weight, which you could say, well, okay, that could be useful, okay, in some situations, but the side effect of that is that they weren't really synthesizing enough ATP. And for some tissues, like the cardiac muscle, this is deadly, okay? The cardiac muscle and nerve cells, et cetera, et cetera, they have to produce a lot of ATP to keep working. If you dis disrupt the potential, that means the less ATP is being produced and they often die because of heart failure because the heart just couldn't cope with it, okay? It just didn't have enough ATP to keep going, okay? Now, dinitrophenol was actually used as a dieting pill, okay? Uh, but it was banned after about a decade or something like that because a lot of the patients taking it died. The trouble is, hmm? well, the thing is, the difference between the effective dose and the lethal dose is very tiny and it's individually different. For different people, the sensitivity to the lack of ATP is different. <laughs> So it's, it's, a, an, it's an extremely unsafe drug because it's, yeah, it's very difficult to dose right, okay? That's why it was banned, but amazingly, you can still, to this day, you can still buy pills with dinitrophenol over the internet, okay? They are extremely dangerous, don't do it, okay? They are deadly, but still, you know, people buy them. I mean, they will lose weight, <laughs> but they also die. So, uh, not ideal, not ideal. A lot of research, as you can imagine, a lot of research, a lot of money is poured into designing uncouplers that would let you lose weight, but they wouldn't kill you, okay? So far, none of them were discovered. So basically, if it works as an uncoupler, it will kill you. And if it doesn't work, you're not gonna lose any weight, okay? So, so far, this attempts to make a better, more safe uncoupler have been unsuccessful. Um, Yeah, the, the last little topic which is connected to this whole synthesis of ATP and the respiratory chain, et cetera, is something that we covered already a few times, and that's the idea of macroergic compounds. So once again, macroergic compounds are compounds that are capable of powering some processes, some reactions, which normally would not happen because they go against the drop in Gibbs energy, right? There are processes in metabolism where we, we need to build something, we need to go you know, ac yeah, against the uphill or something, against the drop of, of Gibbs energy. And for that, we use reactions which on the other hand are very spontaneous, which really go down, decrease Gibbs energy. For example, the hydrolysis of ATP, okay? So all the macroergy compounds do this, they can power other processes. And the reason why they can do it is, what makes them macroergic? they are kept very far away from the equilibrium. That's it, okay? So ATP is macroergic because the ratio of ATP to ADP is kept very far from the equilibrium. Phosphocreatine, or creatine phosphate, is macroergic because in our cells it is kept very far from the equilibrium, okay? Uh, Can Macroergic. macroergic, okay? And other types of macroergic compounds are, for example, esters, thioesters, with coenzyme A, okay? So acetyl coenzyme A, etc. they're also macroergic compounds. Why? Because in our cells, they're kept very far from the equilibrium, okay? So the ratio between acetyl-CoA and acetate and CoA is kept far away from the equilibrium mixture, okay? So all the, all the macroergic compounds that you will hear about are macroergic because of this. Cells keep them far away from equilibrium, and that's why we can use them to power things, okay? Tomorrow, I think tomorrow, when you talk about the Krebs cycle, you will see some reactions which are, pow which are powered by hydrolyzing these esters with coenzyme A, for example. All right, any questions? Yeah. If you could just keep it down for a few more minutes, yeah? 
Not sure I understand. Energy can be used by heat or work. Heat or work, yes. Transferred, yeah. If it's not work, so then it must be heat. Yeah. Any other question? All right, okay.